stars here are different. Like the air, it's different, feels different, tastes different, is different. It's like, it's like breathing in. And I do, I breathe it in. Standing in my parents' driveway out past Beringa, the Murray River spread out below and a river of stars up there. Crusher dust all stirred up by the ute and I'm full with it. The air, the dust, the stars, the longing. My mum read The Hobbit to me when I was five. A chapter at a time curled up on that old floral lounge. She's still got it, sitting out in the back room, collecting other shit she can't get rid of, teapots, old manila folders, a bowl for the dog that died five years ago, and an absolute army of canvas shopping bags that never get used because no one ever remembers to chuck them in the car when they go to the shops. So they have to buy a new one every single time. Maybe not every single time, but you know what I mean. Anyway, after The Hobbit, she read me the entire Narnia series. And I reckon after that, I was reading myself and I just never stopped. I read every Dragonlance book our little library in Renmark had, then the Pern books and Catherine Kerr and all the others. If it had a dragon on the cover, I was going to devour it. Mum ended up having to sign a note saying that I could borrow from the adult section because I'd read all the books I was interested in in the kids section. I read the first Game of Thrones book when I was like 14, 15. So like, I don't know, what's that, 15 years ago? So I thought it was cool before everyone else had even heard of it. Not that I've ever been cool or that I need to be or want to be. And anyway, that shit doesn't matter as much once you get out of high school. You can go find your people then, the people you actually like, not just the ones born in the same year as you. And I mean, everyone leaves after high school anyway. That's what they say. That's the story. Everybody leaves. All the young people. We stayed though. Owen and Lauren and me. We stayed and we're still here now and that's nothing to be ashamed of. Who'd want to go to Adelaide? Concrete and traffic lights and people just all up in your space? Who'd want to go there? And you could be here. Everything I want, everything I need is right here. Though, to be fair, a bigger library as a kid would have been great. Must be really great to be a kid now with the internet. Like growing up with it, ebooks and fan fiction and chat rooms, right? Plenty of places to find your people, places to hunt down any kind of story you want. There are stories here too. In this place, in this river, in this land, in this big open sky. It's right there in front of me. I open my wings. They're big and strong and purple, like a twirl wrapper with flecks of yellow, gold. I spread my wings and I launch myself up into that big open sky. My mouth full of gum leaves and ears full of river, scales and muscles and dreams riding the wind, I'm up high, real high. This place, our riverland, all the little townships and blocks and the river itself, it all just becomes lines and shadows. And that promise, you know, of maps on the inside cover of any fantasy novel worth reading. Each dot on this map tells my stories. But this place, it isn't mine, because it isn't anyone's. It belongs to itself, and I belong to it. <laughs> Wings and teeth and memory, and I'm blocking out the stars if someone just thought to look up. But no one does. I fold my wings and my claws, talons, I'm going to go with claws. My claws, they stretch out in front of me, 
honing in on my target. I'm fast and I'm deadly and I'm reaching down and I'm grasping a fox that shouldn't be here or a cat, trying to clear him out, make it safer, you know, for all our endangered little microbats and turtles. I chase all the foxes and the cats and all the other invaders away for the night and then satisfied and full, I glide down low following the glow of street lights and houseboats that haven't gone to bed. I tuck my wings in close and I circle back to skim beneath the berry bridge, my nostrils full of river smell and mud. And then I settle on the slanted roof of the berry visitor center. You know, the one it's odd angles are a perfect perch. In fact, maybe it's my weight, me sitting on it all the time, sinking down through the steel and glass and concrete. Maybe that's what's made the whole place look lopsided. Down in there, the very visitor center, I mean, they've got a little pet Murray River turtle. I take my niece there to feed her sometimes. The turtle, not my niece, obviously, though they do have a cafe next door. Anyway, the ladies in the visitor center, they'll sprinkle a little food on the top of her tank and we'll watch her little mouth gobble it up. There's a sign on the tank. It says her name is Bonnie because she was born in Lake Bonnie, like me. Like I wasn't born in or on the lake exactly, obviously, but my parents, they used to have a little house down on the highway there in Barmra. And I was born in the Barmra Hospital. I don't think anyone's allowed to have babies there anymore. I reckon they all get sent to Barry now. I guess. Must be happening everywhere, small towns, services drying up or centralising. My dad was born in the Barmer Hospital though, and all his brothers, their dad too. If I have kids, no continuing that tradition, I guess. Not, not that I think I will have kids. I mean, I might, I, I, I don't know. I don't hate them or whatever. I just, I just, I like doing my own thing. You know, going to work, coming home, going down the river, curling up in the hammock with a book, just living. I can spread my wings whenever it suits me without, without anyone else to let down. I think, I think he would have come around eventually. My old man, he never got the chance to, and it's, it's okay. It is, but I think, I think he would have come round eventually. Folk like me leave because it's easier. It's easier to be who you are in a bigger place where you can hide when no one notices that you're a bit different. But I mean, in a little place, everything makes you a bit different. Brain hair, play Dungeons and Dragons, can't play sport, nose always in a book and yeah, I've got plenty of ways not to fit in here. My old man, he was the kind of bloke who wanted to fit in or at least he was the kind of bloke who didn't want to stand out. Anyway, he's gone. Mum's always been all right about stuff. You know, she's, she's a bit rough around the edges, but always supportive, always up for a laugh and always welcoming to whoever I bring home. Not that I've lived home for years now. I've got a little place on that, you know, that invisible cusp between Winky and Glossop. But, you know, the two little towns that got left behind by a highway detour and a little bit of neglect. Anyway, my place is one of those old block houses so it's half falling down, it's cheap rent. It's got this nice patch of bare dirt around the house, plenty of room to land and sink my claws and belly down into that soil. There's rows of vines though, stretching out on every side. So I'll probably die of cancer too. It's the sprays and shit, you know, settles on the roof, then down into your rainwater tank. We're all gulping it down here, present and past, myth and science or whatever's left after that. The way this year is going, maybe none of us will live long enough to get cancer. Maybe we'll all end up with the COVID. Kind of, kind of doesn't really feel real here. 
we're so far away from everything. But still, we are pretty close to the Victorian border. One of my mum's mates works out at Yamba as a checkpoint for anyone crossing the border. And usually it's just about stopping people bringing fruit in, um, you know, to stop fruit flying, whatever. But now it's stopping people trying to sneak into South Australia and it all, it all just seems a bit more sinister now. Nothing much has really changed for me, though, for us. Just lots of crosses made of duct tape telling you where to stand. I say that. I say nothing much has changed. But really it has. Everything has. You can see it in people's faces. Everyone looks completely wrecked, tired, you know, real, real tired. I never never wanted to leave like everyone else. And I still don't. But it feels weird thinking that I can't leave, you know? Like before, if I wanted to, I could have saved and bought myself a ticket to anywhere. Now the rest of the world just feels really, really far away. Even Adelaide. We'd usually be down like every month or every couple of months. We haven't been down since February. And usually, you know, we'd visit friends or hit that little comic book store or front of mall or just kick around. Now we're just home. Guess our annual pilgrimage to Avcon is off the cards too. So that means no cosplay, no, you know, the artist alley, all those tables of art. And just none of that, that buzz. Maybe next year. This year I just go to work. Come home, get online, or read. There's always new places to go that way, between the covers of a book. And so here I am, giving it a go myself, trying to tell a story, my own story. Because when I breathe it in, this place, these stars, these gum trees and memories and all the bits that make this place home. That's a longing in my mouth, in my ears, in my skin, in myself. To tell our story. Sunday night, I hear Dad ruffling his shoes in the corridor. I don't have time for this, but I'd never say that to Dad. We'll find something good tonight, he says as he walks towards the front door. It's the third night this week we've been out looking. We found nothing worthwhile. Either people are hoarding or someone else is picking out all the things worth saving. We can't be too long. I have an assessment due tomorrow. I say in a half. Just two blocks tonight, I promise, Dad quips. I throw on a jumper and we make our way out. I look across our small dining table and notice Dad's little Lebanese coffee cup. He never finishes his coffee if he's going on a collection walk. I call it a collection walk because I don't know any other way to describe it. Down three flights of stairs and my mind races through all the content I need to remember for my assessment. It's a music assessment, an original piece played on the piano. I've spent all year perfecting it and I won't let tonight interfere. As we walk down the stairs, I hear the Asian lady number two shouting at her husband. She's always shouting at him. I have yet to hear him speak. Dad throws me a plastic bag as he holds a bunch in his hand. We have the council tip collection calendar on the fridge. Everything we do is timed immaculately to coincide with a tip collection. Dad is optimistic tonight. I sense it in the rhythm of his steps. There is a slight carefree stance about him, almost making me feel hopeful. I hope I'm right. We walk down the footpath, round the block and through the park. 
The moon has lit up the night, giving us a clear stream of silver. Don't pity us, you prick, standing bright up there in all your glory. All I'm doing is living in Dad's hope that he finds something useful, something that we can sell. Even if we don't, that has never stopped him from searching, perhaps making him even hungrier for that one find. One good find can buy us groceries for the next week. I walk down Karen Street and look up at the flats. Buildings lined up consecutively after each other. Yet out here it is quiet and the footpath is ours. We pass two guys probably around my age. A thick necklace with a crucifix dangles around his neck, shimmering lightly in the moonlight. We pass swiftly, avoiding any eye contact. I don't even hear them talking to each other. The flats continue as we walk down the thin footpath. Television lights reflect off, reflect off window glass and envy sets in. I see shadows on couches watching television as we walk past the flats. But here I am, walking side by side with my dad, holding garbage bags in the hopes of filling them with the sins of people's over-consumerism. That pile is new, Dad says. We walk towards it. I notice an Indian man wearing a turban walking out of his garage. He walks over to the pile and throws another bag of rubbish on top of the pile. My pace slows down and I don't want to be noticed by anyone. A part of me wants to die every single time someone sees us going through their garbage. Dad may have grown out of being concerned, but I feel humiliated every single time. Sometimes a look of confusion lingers on people's faces when they see us going through their garbage. But mostly a glint of empathy as we go through their rubbish. Don't give me your empathy or sympathy. Just throw something out, something useful that my dad can sell. Something that will satisfy him so we can go home and I can work on my assessment. Hurry up, Tariq. Dad raises his voice as I slow down my pace. This pile looks good, come and see. Finally, the Indian man disappears back into the flats. Dad rummages through the pile of rubbish, scanning a few VHS tapes, some old books, pictures. I help Dad move a few larger things out of the way. There has to be something here. What are these books? I look at the titles that read Law and Life, Communication and Law, old university textbooks. Can we sell them? I don't think so. Everything is online now. Fuck, he whispers. As Dad lifts up another bag, an old brown long rectangle case falls onto my foot. I kick it away and it slightly becomes a jar. The moonlight reflects back onto a slight glow on the case. Curiously, I open it. An old violin lies inside the case. Dad doesn't take notice. Continuing his incessant rummaging through the pile, he starts placing a few small vases and frames under his arm. I glance at the violin once more. Dad, what about this? He takes a quick casual look at the rectangle case. Using his experience from rubbish tip picking, he confidently says, rubbish. Yalla, let's go. With a little bit of hope from finding a couple of vases that he can polish up, he begins walking to another pile of rubbish. I follow him. An instant memory of wanting to learn a musical instrument when mum was alive floods my mind for a moment as I watch dad's dark silhouette standing on top of another pole destined for the tip. I make my way back to where I found the violin. I pick it up and walk towards dad. Rubbish, Tariq, rubbish. Trust me. I need your arms to carry things that are actually worth something. I want this violin. Come and help me move this panel. There could be some good stuff underneath. I place the violin carefully on the footpath and begin helping him. Three vases, a handful of glass cups and a few oven shelves. Dad is content on retiring for the night. 
We slowly make our way back home with our finds in tow. I look up and the moon is exactly where I saw it last. It seems a little darker walking back. Again, we pass hundreds of flats and the glow from the street lights seems to have dissipated. We walk through the park that is usually crowded during the day by older Lebanese men playing chess and Muslim families that bring their kids here after school. I hold my violin tight, as if I've always held this case. Why are you bringing that piece of shit home? I don't respond. Rubbish, he says again. It's always been Dad and I at home. When I was seven, Mum went to a place where she is a queen. And Dad would say that every single time I questioned if she was coming back. A place where what we needed existed in abundance. If I asked Dad where Mum is now, he'd say the same thing. Dad has always provided. He has had so many jobs and without complaining, just does what he needs to do. I want to change all that. I want to make something of myself. I don't want to just get by. I want to be comfortable. My mother taught me how to play the piano when I was five and I've played it ever since using the school piano. Playing the piano is the only way I could feel that my mother is around me. I have vivid memories of mum playing the violin when I was younger. When she passed, dad sold off everything that reminded him of her, including her violin. That's how he dealt with her loss. It's 1am and I finally walk back into my room. I should be asleep. I place the violin case on the floor of my bedroom. I study the old case, the carving and the roughed up edges. I look at the faded brown leather and I wonder its age. Good night, Habibi, Dad says from the small hallway. I open the case and carefully take out the violin. I get the accompanying bow that still has a string attached to it. I place the bow lightly on the string of the violin. The sound instantly wraps around my body, filling my mind with sparks of orange light and shards of childhood memories. I place my fingers on the case and analyze it for a moment. Who owned it? Why has it been thrown out? The questions start to flow and come to a halt when I realize my assessment is due in the morning. We've never had money for things like musical instruments, but perhaps dad could restore it. I fall onto my bed and I hold the violin in my arms. Maybe it will remind him of mum. Or maybe I will restore it and hide it from him. The same thoughts circulate in my mind and my eyelids become heavy. I fall asleep with the violin in my arms. I'm sitting, waiting and worrying, and Bert comes to me. He's my grandfather, and he went to the First World War and came back with four medals and a thumb that had only a sliver of nail sticking out from the top. This was the finger he lit his pipe with. He was a hero, a sergeant major in the ambulance corps. He spends four years in the trenches of France. He ferries the injured out of no man's land back to safety. You've seen the pictures, M mud, blood and mateship. He was the same when I remember him 50 years later, but a bit staggerier. There's an odd look in his eyes, glazed behind horn rims, and he's a bit distant. If you ask him about the war, he shuts down. If pushed, he deflects talks about other people's bravery rather than his own. He's known for setting up the first RSL in his neighbourhood to look after the boys, his boys. Connection and family are important to him. He lives within a stone's throw of all of his family, his sisters, his cousins, uncles, his sons and daughter and their families and even his in-laws. A pack, 
they congregate. He's a part of a long line of Methodist missionaries bringing the word of God to the heathens in China and Japan. God's on his side, even in the trenches. After the war, he walks out into ever rapidly faster traffic, knowing he'll get safely to the other side. He knows anyone who honks him is one of his boys saying, G'day, mate. He holds his lighter out to us when we're young to blow the flame out. I can still smell the lighter fluid and the smoke. He stays in the same house until the council move him. They need the house for a car park, tar and cement. Me, I've always been itinerant. 35 house moves so far, suburbs, inner east, inner west, close to the neighbours, close to work, more cement than grass, often only cement. Here, it's the opposite, Maclean, the Scottish town, a blip on the motorway between Sydney and Brisbane, in between two giant national parks. Check out the tartans painted on the telegraph poles. It's lush, green, everything a city is not. We came here after the kid left school. We used to come here on holidays, camping near the beach, to be with friends who are closer than family. And over 10 years or so, we make friends locally. So when we left the big smoke, we gravitate up here and settle. Yeah, yeah, we're tree changers, or we pretend to be. Living up here is like living in a suburb, but it's an older suburb. Well, the inhabitants are like us, grey nomads that stopped, pulled up a stump and sat down for a while. And why do we live where we live? Oh, it's beautiful. It's warm. It's green. When you put a, a stick in the ground, at least. It's a town that used to be the centre of the Shire, on one of the small hills that jut out of a floodplain. It perches on the edge of a giant river, 10 k's as the crow flies from the coast. It's a kilometre wide. The river used to be the highway back in the 1800s, so the river was their front door. Levees along the river bank hold the floods back. It's got an old fashioned style to it, somewhere in the 1940s or earlier. It's 3,000 inhabitants, a couple of semi-connected villages in rural splendour. On the beaches, there's tourism. You can tell the visitors, they dress differently. They're full of expectations in themselves. This region's based on farming, fishing and sugar cane. They harvest prawns in the river, both the sugar mill and the fishing are now co-ops. They've bunched together to make a living out of their industries. Sugar is harvested here from June to December, and it's impressive. At dusk, when the wind drops, they light the fields to be harvested tomorrow. Giant plumes of smoke float in the twilight. Swathes of flame, the roar of the fire, the smell of burnt cane and sugar. And the next morning, grey flakes of cane ash cover the cement all over town, really, depending on the wind. My brother-in-law and his wife stay with us when they move up from the nation's capital. They renovate nearby, closer to the village that houses my wife's parents. Yeah, they moved up too. This guy is one of those men who has no problems with people. He moves into town and knows anyone who was anyone really quickly. His wife's the same, something I missed out on. They stay with us for a couple of months in our little place, stamping their mark all over it. I really enjoy having him around. He's a feeder, bright, alert, funny as a wheel. His barbecues are something to behold. Three different meats, sizzling sausages, fried bread. The place he buys swells from a two-room place to a four-bedroom place with two dining rooms, a studio, Outdoor kitchen, office, work shed and chicken coop built himself. It's set in a block that backs onto the National Park that runs unhindered 90 kilometres along the coast. He knows everything from machinery to carpentry to computers, design, electrical wiring, cars to bird calls, butchering animals and gardening. I sort of hope that some of his encyclopedic knowledge would rub off on me. It doesn't.
He's the sort of guy who's good in a crisis. When I put my car into a sand pit, he's the guy I call. When I need a replacement veranda, he's the one. Why is the gas water hot so water surface making that noise? What bird is that? He's got the answer. He reminds me of a past time, that pioneering, hard-working, tiller of soil, breaker of back, master of all trades, forging a place out of the wilderness. He doesn't buy. He forages for his wood for his stove. He heads out with his trailer and chainsaw and hours later comes back with it full. His wood heaps are immaculate. Sitting around the fire pit on a cold winter night, the fire pit a cut down 40 gallon drum. He burns lumber from the build, toasting one side and then the other, feet up, staring at the stars, reviewing our ancient urges, belonging to a contented and well-fed tribe. His pile of logs is almost symmetrical. Nothing like the haphazard pile that I push together every year and we all dance around, Chardonnay in one hand, a stick to poke the embers of garden offcuts in the other. Ah, and then it didn't rain for years. The dryness not evident, but what was green wilted. Even the gums in survival mode shed leaves. It's hard to tell the bush between bush wet and bush dry. But the fires, they catch in the north and rampage through mountainsides and getting caught in valleys. The news broadcasts are full of firefighters battling the flames that encroach on homes and properties. Legions of kangaroos heap through smoke. Koalas caught in the blazes that leap roads and gullies and roar up cliff faces. The blaze settles in. Fingers of fire advanced east towards the coast and south towards Arf. We feel safe where we are to start off with, then the danger starts to feel real. On a drive out to check my new son's home site, we pass through a casino. We find about 10 water bombing helicopters grounded at the oval, hidden in the smoke. They couldn't fly, visibility problems. And at home, it's like living in a cigar. The smoke dries you out, it settles, smells sour, unlike burning cane, and it thickens. A fire starts 45 kilometres north from our place. It leaps the highway and takes two days to push south with a tailwind. It's water bombed, but it burns in National Park. Hard to access, impossible to contain with little road access and the fluky winds. There are crews, valiant fighters, local and interstate, but they can't contain a wide fronted fire. It's out of control. In an instant, it's flanking us. There, on the other side of the river, the front is three, five kilometres long and the smoke thicker than any cane fire. My sister-in-law is with me and we stand watching the bush, just like any bush, khaki as any eucalypt, vomit smoke. It's a stone's throw, a kilometre off, a bit too close for comfort. She sobs next to me. She and my brother-in-law have lived through a devastating bushfire before. They are in the middle of the suburbs of Canberra and its urban design allowed for corridors of native bush to spread almost to the centre of the city. And the bush burnt through these corridors and it got way too close for them. Oh, but we, we are safe. I know we are. I'm not religious, but I know my grandfather's God is on my side and the pocket of bush I live in is fairly secure. We have to go south after this. We travel south for 400 k's before the smoke clears. The trees on the sides of the road are burnt matchsticks, blackened soil and leaning fence posts. You could tell where the, where the rural fire service had been. The houses we see are ringed by a small dried circle of grass, but the roadsides have m melted. On the way back, we're looking forward to our green valley at our southern side of the hill. But what we think is going to be a quiet night doesn't end up that way. My brother-in-law and his wife and her father have moved in. Their place had to be evacuated. Patrols up and down the roads next to the National Park. The RFS asks them to move out and they do. My brother-in-law is edgy. He has lost his g'day what's happening mate persona. 
He empties their three cars of valuables under our house and fills the place with silence and gloom. Well, they did. He just keeps moving. He doesn't settle his place. What he holds dear is being attacked. His eyes flicker faster than he moves. Sometime during the night, he leaves. He goes over to look after the property and because, the road, because of the road closure, we don't hear from him for days. The phone line to his place is dead. Besides, he's nowhere near the phone. And the mobile is in a black spot there. It's never worked. In the middle of the second night, it got close. He's out there with two garden hoses, on guard. A truck turns up. It's from out of state. Strangers. They mow down the bushes in the neighbour's place, push through a fence, and the crew leaps at the blaze as it leapt at the back fence line. Reinforcements arrive. He joins them, a band of brothers, a common bond to save his house and the world. And I sit and wait and worry. He turns up three days later, branded, dirty, a scruffy dog, smelling of smoke and ash. We ask about it, but he blocks or deflects. His eyes remind me of my grandfather's. His stories are the same.